guys, it's Figs. Down on my trip to Louisville, uh, good friends of mine decided to do a side journey today, and uh, my friends Art Parola and Bill Merkley have taken me down to eastern Kentucky, uh, an area that's known as Slade, Kentucky. And in Slade, Kentucky, there's the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. And this place is absolutely amazing. It's a must-see destination. Uh, Jim Harrison here, he's been doing it for a long, long time. Uh, he is in the North America. He is the number one leading venom extraction for medical purposes. So every single day at 1 p.m., they do a live venom extraction. Today, we're gonna to be dealing with, I believe, Western Diamondback snakes, and he's gonna be extracting venom pretty much all day long. So come on, guys, we're gonna go inside. Let's get a tour. The diversity of this place is over the top. All the animals are in absolute superb conditions. The enclosures are clean. The staff are knowledgeable. The protocols in place for safety of all the guests are top notch. This is an absolute breathtaking place to come visit. Being a reptile zoo, they do have many other animals available. They do have a nice uh, American alligator. They have smaller ones that are used for photo opportunities. They have a wide selection of turtles. But uh, for me, the highlight will always be the snakes. And the venomous snake collection that Jim Harrison and his team hold here at the Kentucky Zoo is absolutely second to none. Coming up in a bit, I'll show you the venom extractions that were going on that day. After his venom extractions, we were able to spend several hours with Jim, and uh, he gave us a tour of some different facilities and stuff, and we had a great, great time. An extremely knowledgeable man. I feel very fortunate for the opportunity. We'll get to that in a bit, but for now, let's just sit back and enjoy the serpents. Venom extraction for you guys, uh, the ones that you know, that actually bring in the dollars would be the rattlesnakes because that's the one that actually it, it, it brings in money, but without being open to the public, doing lectures and doing all kinds of different stuff, we wouldn't exist. Because yeah. the venom is, is a very small, I can do in one weekend enough venom to make the anti for the whole United States, and once that's sold, I still have to feed the animals, I have yeah. to take care of. So but you don't get a lot of call for a lot of the oddball other species that you carry for venom. Oh, uh, we get, we get, we sell, I've milked or extracted from, I hate the word milking. Um, I've extracted from every species of venomous snake that's ever been brought into captivity at one point. Um, when I started, I started extracting to Dr. Sherman and then a few researchers, and that's how I got started. The first snake I ever extracted venom from was a king soldier. That's what I started on. Yeah, yeah, just baby step into it, eh? <laughs> yeah, well, Sherman had a lot of trust in me, and it had a lot more to do with the fact that, you know, I've been interested in snakes since I was a kid, yeah. 
and I called him up and he was extremely nice to me. He saw the passion. <laughs> yeah, I'm turning my radio off because they can't seem to get the, they're not supposed to be talking constantly and telling stories while I'm milking. Um, yeah, he, he saw, well, he thought he had the passion himself. I mean, I've got, when he passed away, he gave me, Pat, you want to show him the shed thing? I'm sure you've seen shed things before, but there's one for you. Yeah, they shed their fangs periodically, and as you saw, there's one that's operational that comes right into place. So, <laughs> so the venom on that doesn't um, wouldn't affect. All it all it can do is sensitize you to the venom. That's all it would do. You know, if you if you're going to be somebody who's working with them all the time, you have to be careful about getting it on your skin. You have to be very careful because you're going to all the idiots that are self immunizing have no idea about immunization. They don't understand the venom. They don't understand anaphylaxia. They don't understand. You know, you create an allergy, correct? Yeah. What's that? You create an allergy to it. You can. Okay. Your body's gonna eventually fight it because it's foreign proteins. But it's so complex foreign proteins that there's no way you build up antibodies for it. it it's not like, you know, we can desensitize you to a bee sting. You can't desensitize you to a snake bite because it's too complex. Once you build up an allergy, you've got an allergy over. Give you a lot? Either Western down the way. Yeah, I had one that I had for 30 years. It was on a production line that we called Overachiever. And she, <laughs> for a long time, held the record. She still holds it for the United States. Held the record for the most yield in one extraction. She would give up to, on her, every two weeks, three grams freeze dried of them. So that's 3,000 milligrams. Now, Ash Eye, the um, Ash's Spitting Cobra, that was, um, God, I'm, I can't, can't keep my date straight. I think it was 10 years ago it was described. It used to be lumped with my Grick list and all those. But Ash Eye actually gives eight grams. And then it grows to almost 12 feet. Yeah. So it's got a head was as big as my fist. Yeah. So nobody has them in the United States, and that's actually one of the few that I haven't worked with. <coughs> but it's all, a, in all my years of keep, I never kept any Alaskans at all. There's one that was just they weren't readily available to me. Right. And uh, because I never worked with them, I just have a different level of respect for them because they don't. They're not going to shy away from you. They'll come at you some of them. Yeah. Go, oh. They 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 when they're cornered, they get a, they get a little. I mean, I, I started working at a very young age with mambas and milking mambas and stuff, and I learned the first thing I learned, I've trained a lot of people to work with mambas, the first thing I learned was yeah. you don't make them do anything. <laughs> you, you just kind of flow with what's going on. Yep. You never touch them on the nose. If you touch a rattlesnake on the nose, you'll go backwards. You touch a mamba on the nose, they will come forward. Yep. So it, you just got to kind of play them by, it's like, I tell people, you know, you never assume your opponent is going to do anything. Yep. The, the result? Blue brown, so strike for diamonds. You are not the one that this is the one. I thought about it and I thought about it. No, it kind of makes ID. It's always equal to snake, so strike for the blue. And he broke off his rattle, so he doesn't have the rattle, he still has the so button, he, so, but. So he'd be even more fun in the wild. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he'll grow him back, he always, he just, this one's got a, like a screw loose. This one was actually found in an area in the wild where some of the original albino animal genetics were found. Hmm. There was an old snake pit in the area, and the guy had, he was, he, the story goes that he was the one who found the original uh, Western Diamondbacks that were albino that ended up at the Dallas Zoo, but he had some in his own collection, and maybe some of them may have escaped. <laughs> so. Jim knows full well the dangers he faces every single day with keeping this collection of highly venomous creatures. He's a highly educated and extremely responsible keeper of these type of reptiles. 
He is regarded the worldwide as a leading expert in the field of venomous snakes. This retired police officer, paramedic, and champion kickboxer has put himself in harm's way for many, many years and does so daily for the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. Separation. There's glycogen in there and there's high, heavier proteins that all go to the bottom and stuff. Some of our customers want the venom um, spun out, put into a centrifuge and spun. This customer does it. They just want pooled venom because they're using it all in research. And the more diverse it is, the better because there is differences even among the same species and even in the same area. We're finding out all kinds of things now that we have a, we have equipment that uh, you know like laugh or you know, the spectrograms and all that stuff. We can look at the venom and it's so sensitive now that in the old days we needed gram of venom to do a test. Now we need point one. <laughs> and actually, my wife's working with. Uh, uh, a gentleman from India that's doing a genome project, and what we're doing is we're trying to make venom from the DNA. And so they'll be making venom in a t petri dish. Completely synthesized. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, you know that the, uh, the ACE inhibitors that you use on people, that was developed from snake venom originally, and now it makes it better. So, Vieta, the uh, drug for type 2 diabetes, was made from Gila, Gila venom, Gila monster, what people call a Gila monster. I hate the word monster, but it's a lizard. And they made the um, they made the first drug out of the venom itself, and now they make it synthetic. Uh, what's the, what's the it's on the table. Now guys, if you are ever going to get to the point where you're going to consider going into keeping of venomous snakes or venomous reptiles or dangerous animals, make sure you understand the ramifications, the seriousness of it. This is not something that you should tread into lightly. There are absolute massive ramifications, not only for your personal health, but those around you. True experts are people that keep hots, as they're called, snakes that are venomous, we often call them hots. Real keepers of hots have a massive series set of protocols. If you guys remember in some of the videos I showed you with my good friend Dan, he has a lot of set of protocols for every single animal in the event that something should happen. He has the fail safes, he has lockdown rooms, everything. Because if something happens to you, you want to ensure that something doesn't happen to your family member that finds you. That's the big, big thing. Again, also understand that there's legal aspects in regards to keeping these things. Make sure that if you are in an area that can keep them, that you have the proper paperwork if necessary. And if you're in an area that can't, don't do it illegally because you're just putting everyone else at danger as well as the hobby. I can't stress it enough. Educate yourself. This book by B.W. Smith, Venomous Snakes in Captivity, Safety and Handling, has been the Bible for, for many, many years. Guy's very, very well renowned for it. And I, I, I urge you to read this book on venom. This will give you a better understanding. It's not specifically snake venom or reptile venom. It'll go into discussions about bee stings and anything else, tarantulas, and just understanding how venom works. One thing that we talked about a little bit briefly, I believe, in one of the videos was that... Um, a snake bite, when a snake bites you, it doesn't automatically, it's, not, it's, it's, it's like a needle, but the needle doesn't go directly into a vein. The snake generally bites you on tissues that are muscular tissues, and that means that the venom is going into tissue, not going into your bloodstream, which is what most people think is what's happening. That's not the case. The critical, critical thing with a snake bite, if you were to be envenomated by a snake bite, is to keep absolutely calm. The calmer, I know it's hard to say that until you've been in that situation, but the calmer you are, the better it is because this the method of conveyance for, for the venoms primarily is going to be through the lymphatic system which is the the, the 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 liquids that transfers in your muscular tissues and moves through your tissues it moves at a much slower pace and the slower and the calmer we can be the better for everything now we've even gotten past that step and we're ready to go there's certain aspects there's certain equipment that you're going to want to have on hand 
Keeping venomous snakes is not like keeping a corn snake or a ball python or a pet snake. These are not animals that need to be held. These are not animals that should be held. These are animals that should be kept, researched, studied, observed, but handled very, very carefully using specific tools. Snake hooks, they come in many, many, many different shapes and sizes, depending on the species, different lengths and whatnot. Uh, the one I like the best, the one I take in the field with me all the time, is actually from Midwest Tongs. It's, uh, it's fully aluminum, so it's lightweight, it's easy to travel with, very, very well constructed. It's chambered, so it's actually, it's not going to bend under stress. I can, ca I can ca pick up a four to six foot snake with this, no problem in the wild. Feel totally comfortable and safe that I'm at a safe distance, safe working distance of the animal and me. If you are going to be dealing with uh, going out in the wild, this one's not collapsible, but this is the, the standard in the industry. This is uh, the, the Midwest tongs, uh, tongs really, <laughs> and it's meant, it's a nice wide channel. It's meant for heavier bodied snakes, like some of your rattlesnakes, uh, gaboon vipers, things like that. Any of those heavy bodied snakes, you definitely don't want to be picking up with a single hook. It's too much strain on the one or two ribs. Use a couple of hooks, move the animal, and uh, work with them that way. If you're going to be feeding them, which you should be, you're going to want to make sure you have a good set of hemostats. This is two feet long, works well for me for handling because the only stuff that I dealt with was easy to work with. Transfer it for one case, transfer it into a, either a, a, a lockable garbage can or Rubbermaid or something that has a lockable lid, and that's it. Now it's encased. I know it's safe. I know that I'm safe. Now I can do my maintenance and then reverse it, putting it back in. Safety protocols, take your time, be wise. Thanks, guys.